Hello and welcome to Planet Outlook. On this episode, to, to, to talk about species conservation, we have Dr. Dhananjay Mohan, Director of Wildlife Institute of India. Thank you, Dr. Mohan, for joining us on Planet Outlook. Yeah, my pleasure. Dr. Mohan, <clears throat> there is a lot of talk about climate change, but as we speak also, the sixth mass extinction is also unfolding us. Mm -hmm. And India being a mega diverse country, we have three biological hotspots. Uh, it, so although we have done well in conservation, but it's also become more and more challenging in India in terms of wildlife conservation. And, and what do you have to say? I mean, what, what do you see in this uh, landscape? Uh, well, as you rightly said, India is a mega biodiversity country. And uh, uh, but at the same time, we have, I think, 1.38 billion people. So it's always a great challenge to actually uh, co continue with our conservation with so much of uh, dependency on natural resources and having the sheer number of people. And I think uh, the resource hunger is only increasing day by day with modernization coming in, uh, the consumption uh, of uh, beat anything, I mean, power or anything. Uh, it's, it's increasing. We are getting more and more modern, more and more infrastructure. So it's not just the numbers. It's also the increasing trend of dependency on resources. So it's a big challenge. And I think uh, with this, uh, despite this challenge, if we are uh, leading in conservation of certain species and associated habitat, it's something I would say amazing. I mean, to have two thirds of the world's uh, global tiger population in India and to have more than half of our uh, of Asian elephant population, these species are distributed over more than a dozen countries. So uh, that's that actually speaks volume about our conservation effort. But yes, despite that, there are many species which need urgent action. And uh, I think that is the high priority at the present time for all those who are involved in conservation. But you mentioned habitats. So habitats are constantly shrinking. Our uh, PAs, which are wildlife sanctuaries, national parks are becoming islands. So how do you see this challenge unfolding in the coming years? Uh, actually, the shrinkage has kind of already happened. Uh, and off late, of course, we've been holding on to it pretty, pretty well. Because if you look at, for example, the forest cover report, uh, our forest cover is more or less stable. In fact, showing sometimes slight upward trend also. Uh, whatever uh, shrinkage was happening had has already happened. But see, all these things take a long time to show their effect. So we can't just... Uh, be complacent that now we are holding on to whatever we have. See, whatever whatever we have is not sufficient. And that is why extra efforts are needed. And particularly so for uh, some of the endangered species which are threatened with extinction. You are basically leading as the captain of the most premier institute of the country, if I may say, with mm -hmm. consultations with the ministry um, in species recovery program. Uh, there are several species which has been identified by the MOEF with consultation with the Wildlife Institute of India and other institutions. But uh, right, right now, you are focused on four species. So if you can just give an overview of that and then we'll go into each species individually. Right. Uh, see, um, uh, of course, the Wildlife Institute of India with its uh, history of nearly four decades now, has always been the technical arm on wildlife conservation matters for the government and particularly Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change. And uh, uh, we've been working constantly on species and particularly the species which are endangered. But till about, I would say, maybe some seven, eight years back, our efforts were, I would say, uh, not integrated or they were not complete so as to uh, save the species. They were in, in parts, like we may study the ecology of a species, we may know what the issues are, we may, may actually try to address some of those issues, but to look at this conservation in a holistic manner, 
this was initiated only less than about a decade back when we started talking of species recovery programs. So actually coming to think of it, even uh, Project Tiger was like a species recovery program. But uh, those were different times. And uh, the major focus was to set aside areas, give them good protection and good management. Uh, but right now, because actually a good amount of habitat existed and still exists, and that is why we are so uh, pretty reasonably well placed when it comes to tiger conservation and, of course, many other associated species. But there are certain species where just this much of effort is not enough. And they are now in a very precarious condition. So that required much more scientific and much more integrated kind of uh, action. And that is what we collapse into uh, what we term as species recovery programs. So they look at the species ecologies, the threats, what best strategies or a combination of strategies can be done. And, uh, and, and the most important part is that, uh, that are many a times people working on these aspects, the technical aspects, used to do prepare a plan and then leave it for others to execute it. Here, the difference was that the uh, agency which is involved in developing the species recovery program, primarily a Wildlife Institute of India, of course, working in con uh, along with the forest departments and other agencies, besides planning this part, they are also involved completely in the execution part. And that is how this, uh, the present programs are much different from the initiatives done in the past. So uh, uh, way back in 14, 15, 16, when all this was getting discussed uh, and uh, brought into an executable action plan. So that was the time when four species were carefully chosen. Uh, you are aware there are almost two dozen species which have been identified uh, as uh, um, endangered and which require a special effort. But four of these were chosen for uh, this, um, this very special species recovery programs. And I would say they were a little carefully chosen in the sense that these were the ones which perhaps required the most urgent action amongst those large number of species. Or they, they occurred in habitats which never got any attention till that time. I mean, I would give the example of dugong, for example, a species about which people hardly knew. It was not in the focus at all. I mean, unlike, I would say, uh, the gangetic dolphin or uh, the bustard, where there was already a lot of talk about the threads and everything. Dugong was declining without actually knowing much about it, without actually not being discussed. So uh, there was a focus to bring such species also in the forefront of top priority conservation action. So uh, as I said, four species were chosen, uh, the bustard, and of course, along with bustard, they associated another uh, species from the same family, uh, the lesser florican, and then um, uh, dugong, which is also called the sea cow, uh, which is a marine mammal. Then uh, your Sangai, which we know are no, is known only from one population in Manipur. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the river dolphin or the Gangetic dolphin. Okay. So these four were chosen and uh, work started in 2016. So among the four, uh, let me begin with, by asking about the Great Indian Buster, uh, which I think faces uh, the biggest threat today as we speak. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you're very right. I mean, it is perhaps one of the most threatened species in India and even globally, one of the most threatened. And uh, uh, bustard, you know, it's a it's a large bird. It's a it's a heavy bird, specially adapted for uh, arid landscapes. Uh, so traditionally, it was distributed not only in the western part of the country, but even in uh, in uh, peninsular India also, and uh, patches in central and peninsular India where there was arid landscapes. But gradually, uh, it lost grounds because of a number of uh, reasons. And uh, today, it the only stronghold that we have for this bird is in Rajasthan, primarily Jaisalmer district and adjoining areas. So we have uh, uh, 
uh, maybe a little less than 150 birds remaining in the whole world. And it is presently, I would say, more or less restricted only to India. Traditionally, it used to go into uh, Pakistan also. Uh, but uh, maybe sometimes they may stray into Pakistan, but I don't think there is much protection over there. So it's primarily now restricted only to our country. So the entire responsibility of saving this bird from extinction is, uh, is, is kind of ours. And uh, well, over the last, I would say, 60, 70 years, we have seen some catastrophic decline. Of course, when we say this, the numbers assessed in the previous times have been much more crude because the techniques were not there. Not many people were working on it. But still, as people say that around 1970, perhaps we had about 1,200 or 1,300 birds around 1970. And uh, presently, it has gone down to a, maybe a little less than 150 birds. So it's been quite a decline. It's been almost, I would say, 90% decline over, um, what, some 50 years. So it's, it's a pretty steep decline and of course a number of reasons uh, uh, i mean these were the areas which were following a very traditional lifestyle and now things are changing too fast so the habitat is getting altered uh, then a, a lot of other things are happening over there a lot of developmental activities uh, power lines solar power and uh, wind power i mean incidentally these are some uh, ways of green energy. But uh, when it comes to busted, they are turning out to be uh, a very negative factor for their uh, continuance. So, uh, But it is they, also a very slow breeder, I guess. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. It's a, it's a large bird. It's a slow breeder. Uh, usually gives only one egg, uh, unlike most other birds, smaller birds, which may have clutches of five eggs, six eggs. But here it's usually only one egg slow breeder, quite vulnerable to predation from various sources. It's a heavy bird, cannot take off quickly and can get predated by uh, some of the carnivores over there and some of the man-induced carnivores like the stray dogs. So they also have been uh, quite detrimental for uh, the recruitment of this bird because they can prey on the eggs, they can prey on the chicks. So all those threats are there. So things have been changing a lot in that landscape over the last uh, few decades, and that's primarily the reason uh, for its decline. It's, it has always been a low-density bird. See, when we talk about 50 years ago and talking about only 1,213 birds, that means it's it's never it's not supposed to be a high-density bird. It's a large bird. Large birds usually occur in low densities. But right now, of course, it is perhaps uh, surviving at uh, much, much lower uh, density levels than that habitat should survive, uh, that should support. So uh, this was it. And uh, so a multi-pronged approach was used to, uh, uh, I mean, take care of uh, mustard and uh, it included a whole lot of uh, uh, things. There is a breeding uh, program. I, I believe there is a breeding program. Yes, yes, yes. That's been, uh, that is what has been initiated about two years ago. Uh, captive breeding program and uh, incidentally uh, one of the close relative of uh, the great Indian bustard or the Indian bustard, great bustard, uh, uh, another species called Hubara bustard which is found all over the Arabian uh, countries. Uh, there uh, there's been an amazing success of breeding programs and thousands and perhaps I think lakhs of birds have been captive bred and released back in the wild. So we took uh, help of the expertise and uh, there is International Fund for Hobara con Conservation, which is actually, uh, uh, they are the experts on this. They are uh, technically helping us in this program. And our initial success has been very encouraging. In two years, uh, we have had uh, now a captive stock of six, 17 birds and uh, with very low mortality in captivity. We have, I think, till date lost only two birds. Uh, so, um, it's been that way, a very encouraging sign. And the idea is that in a couple of years, we'll have large enough stock in, the, in captivity, which will be bred in captivity, and the young ones will be released back in the wild. So, once we reach that stage, I think a lot of good things will start happening for uh, Buster. 
so uh, the strategy is uh, simple we collect eggs from the wild carry them into uh, the breeding center there's one functional breeding center at some near jaisalmer and uh, another one has come up at ramdevara again uh, i think technically it falls in jodhpur district if i remember correctly but it's almost on the border of the two districts ramdevara is almost ready and uh, we may start using it very shortly but some has been functional for two years and we have now uh, as i said 17 uh, birds there of varying age classes some have, be have been bought um, 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 born this uh, summer and some previous year so uh, and uh, the ones from the previous years are all, all already grown into full size although sexual maturity is usually achieved in 3 to 4 years so we have to wait for that uh, so this has been a very very encouraging uh, step uh, in the in the right direction in addition to that uh, predator proof fences are being created in in the main areas within the desert national park and surrounding landscape so that predators can't predate on the eggs and there is a good recruitment uh, which can be used both by the captive breeders as well as natural replenishment of the population so uh, that's another very important point and uh, then another important thing is that uh, another threat that has been recognized is the mortality going to collision with the power lines so we have identified critical areas and critical lines which uh, need some kind of uh, mitigation in some cases maybe undergrounding and in in uh, many cases fitting them with uh, bird diverters which are actually visible uh, uh, passive devices which are hung on the transmission lines and these transmission lines as i said earlier are largely related to the green energy sources which have come up in this landscape because this is an ideal landscape incidentally for solar power as well as wind power so uh, they have come up only recently and there are uh, good evidences that bustards are actually colliding with these wires because this bird is actually not designed to uh, to look for impediments in the in its flight path it's a bird of arid country so when it flies it it do, it doesn't expect any hindrances to come in in front of it so it it's not so designed to look for wires on the way and in the process sometimes they collide and lose their lives it's a heavy bird the collision can be fatal and it is fatal at uh, on uh, some occasion so all these uh, things are being done uh, the power agencies are also uh, uh, trying to cooperate and uh, like the central electricity authority has standardized the design for bird diverters other ministries are also se seriously working in these directions so of course these are things which require huge sums of money so the progress has been a little slow but i'm sure it will gain momentum and uh, gradually in the in the bustard habitat we will have uh, less and less threat for um, power line coll collisions in future so hubara gives you great hope basically that uh, a kind of a reverse trend is possible for the great indian bustard but what about the timeline when do you think um, it would be roughly appropriate to release birds in the wild how many years after 10 years 15 years no 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 not that long not that long maybe 3 years from now because as i said our captive stock we oh. have uh, chicks uh, from which were born in 2019 so they'll be sexually mature in uh, maybe 23 hmm. and they will start uh, producing young ones so 23 means in a couple of years you can then release them in the wild so maybe 24 25 uh, uh, if all goes well then we should be able to start releasing and uh, them in the wild and uh, restocking the wild and this has been done successfully in hobara bustard of course over there they not only conserve they also indulge in hunting which is of course uh, unthinkable in india and should be unthinkable in india uh, so uh, uh, so they are if i can use that word they are producing hobara almost like a factory so uh, i mean we we don't expect something like that happening here with great bustard but nonetheless it will gain momentum and with every passing years this captive breeding will only gain momentum oh, but, will... what, what, but what about uh, the captive stock um, fending for its own it's it's one uh, way that when it's human fed or human in taken care of by humans it does well but when you release then it has to take fend for itself so there is no. also uh -huh. right 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 so uh, well in our uh, captive breeding centers uh, adequate care has been taken so that they 
the, I mean, the, it has been designed in a way that they can fly around in those. They, we call it tunnel, although they are not tunnels. Uh, they are like uh, dome-shaped, long uh, structures, and they can happily fly within them. So their wings are strong enough, uh, and uh, then minimal human interaction. And then, as I said, we have a great uh, experience of Hawara bustard behind us, and uh, the two species are quite closely related, similar habitat. So we expect that uh, following the same protocols, we will have um, a, a good uh, uh, recovery taking place. And as I said, I mean, uh, things may start happening on the ground. I mean, the releases may start as early as 2024. So it's not very far away. And as I said, I mean, it is not hypothetical talk. The Hobara experience is right behind us, which has been going on for many, many years now. So I'm yes. quite hopeful. I mean, of course, other measures are also going to chip in, but this is going to be the turning point uh, for them. So let's come to the next species, which is the river dolphins. Now, here is a species which, by one, if we talk about range, is a huge range. Huh? It's beyond any PA. It's it's just <clears throat> across the Gangetic, <clears throat> uh, the landscapes. So right. how challenging is to conserve yeah, and bring back the yes. river dolphin. Yes, yes. You very rightly uh, highlighted the challenge. The biggest challenge is that it's a species of the river and large river systems. I mean, Ganges, Brahmaputra. Uh, of course, we have a very small population in uh, Bias also, uh, which is uh, a different species. Uh, so uh, your uh, Ganges dolphin is... Uh, all along the main stem Ganga, as well as some of the major tributaries like Ghagra and Chambal. Uh, so these are the uh, rivers where it, it lives. And uh, as you rightly said, most of our river stretches are actually not in protected areas. And many a times, they are, uh, large cities are located. I mean, historically, the human civilization always uh, developed along the rivers or uh, sea coasts. So many of the large cities are found all along the Ganges. It's the, one of the highest densities of human population anywhere in the world. So uh, I think we're talking of some 23 or 24 crore people. So um, it's extremely challenging. Uh, only thing is, uh, this is uh, a species which, even though it's a large size species, but somehow it has it has not been a a very sought after species uh, by the neither by the fishing community nor by people who indulge in poaching and everything there is there's definitely something happening on that line but uh, had it been a targeted species by poachers and all probably we would have lost it by now because it's a large species may not be so difficult to kill and uh, you know where it occurs uh, but i think uh, for many reasons, I think there is a little bit of relief. I mean, little bit, I wouldn't say a little bit. I think there's substantial amount of uh, religious belief also associated with it. Uh, so uh, the challenge is huge because these are river stretches are not controlled by exclusive department. Unlike our terrestrial protected areas uh, where most of our threatened species are still found, uh, where it's more or less completely managed and controlled by forest departments. Here, the problem is the river belongs to everybody, but doesn't is not owned by everybody. So uh, that is what makes things very challenging. And uh, it is here that we've been continuously trying to rope in uh, agencies like the um, fisheries department, irrigation departments, because they've been controlling rivers for various purposes. So we have uh, we are always trying to take them on board when it comes to Gangetic dolphin uh, uh, conservation. If you talk about issues, well, of course, rivers have been altered, dammed. Uh, pollution is an issue. Huh? Pollution, is a, yeah. pollution, pollution is a huge issue. River pollution, habitat alteration is a major issue. Then accidental entanglement uh, in fishing nets, that's an issue. Uh, and of course, some poaching for meat and oil, dolphin oil is uh, has, a, has some commercial value. So uh, these are things which have actually... Um, taken dolphin to the brink of extinction and uh, we have as per our estimates about 3,000 uh, dolphins left uh, in the river system 
so um and but considering the long rivers and uh, i mean ganges brahmaputra and associated rivers i think it's a very low number i mean uh, in in front of the great indian bustard it may sound a largest number but i think it's extremely low number uh, so uh, that's the thing and uh, so is is there a mechanism in place i mean you as a scientific body can do as a certain part basically as you said it's it the river is controlled by fisheries irrigation there are various government agencies who are part of the river system management uh -huh. so also is there a mechanism in place from the government to bring all to uh, to bring all of you together in the multi agency kind of a approach yeah, actually it's uh, also the national aquatic animal in fact uh, we we are working in that direction but it's not easy because these are uh, stakeholders which uh, have never been involved in such things and as i said uh, unlike the terrestrial is ecosystem where forest department becomes a huge stakeholder and the other stakeholders have smaller roles to play relatively from the government side of course of course local communities are always there and uh, but uh, in this case that's not the case i mean so many uh, government departments are are very important players but we are trying to rope them in i wouldn't say that we have succeeded in that uh, it's the process still on and till now our efforts have been more on certain other things uh, like um, first thing developing a estimation protocol see it's a very difficult species to to estimate so now after uh, a lot of effort it's a very tricky species to actually estimate in in numbers so now after a lot of effort we have developed a, a protocol for its scientific estimation tested it also and uh, we plan to launch it in its entire range uh, this winters so we have already developed a protocol and uh, uh, we are in the process of Uh, fine tuning it and very soon we intend to start uh, trainings not only of the forest department personnel but other departments also in fact this will be one platform where we'll try to uh, bring in all the stakeholders together and uh, this is going to be a large exercise uh, maybe uh, quite similar to your all india tiger estimation although uh, all india tiger estimation goes on in uh, about 18 states this will be uh, relatively i think some six states or seven states so uh, but nonetheless it's going to be a fairly long large exercise and i we we want to use it as a platform also to bring all the all the stakeholders together so that's one thing it took us a lot lot of time to standardize the methodology which is a double uh, observer uh, methodology uh, uh, to be done from uh, from a moving boat and which also uses the acoustic signals being used by dolphins in communication with uh, communicating with each other so it's uh, quite an interesting protocol and uh, i know to launch a protocol of this kind in the beginning can be quite challenging even uh, we we had those similar problems in all india tiger estimation way back in 2006 when the, for the first time we ran it but now after four cycles uh, the the forest department in particular and uh, certain other agencies which help us in now are pretty good at it and uh, they can uh, do things pretty well so this double observer mark recapture method that uh, we're going to follow uh, is uh, uh, i mean will give us how, very good estimation yeah, how, how, how often are we going to do this for dolphins like for tigers you do for once in four years uh actually uh, we will let us go uh, through the experience once maybe okay. we will also uh, decide on a periodicity uh, maybe 3 years or 4 years again uh, but uh, we are uh, right now mainly concentrating on running it once because that will be a great learning for us and you're going to do this in the ganges in the brahmaputra right yeah. right right and of course all the associated tributaries as oh. well yeah so uh, uh, we have with, with our work over the last 5 years we already identified hot spots and uh, this uh, accidental net entanglement for that we have been trying uh, pingers uh, pingers i don't know how it is pronounced which are actually devices which are attached to the nets and they they emit uh, a kind of a, a sound wave which repels uh, the the dolphins because dolphins also depend a lot on acoustic communication 
so this is something that has been tried in other countries and we are we have tried it in india with good amount of success so this is what we want to popularize and uh, maybe with the help of the state governments and fisheries departments in particular uh, develop a mechanism so that uh, the fishermen can happily adopt to this system and we can avoid gangetic dolphin entanglement so uh, uh, then fishermen net networks for rescue of uh, these animals when they get entangled in fact we have another project going on with the funding of uh, national mission from uh, for keep clean ganga on the ganges uh, river and that is where we are also working with the forest departments to set up rescue centers for aquatic fauna and we've already done this for a, a couple of places and uh, plan to do it extend it further to a few more uh, locations so that uh, if there are some accidental entanglement of dolphins or for that matter other aquatic so till now we have hardly been doing any rescue of aquatic animals but they are that's also an issue so we have already started working on this and already a few i know there is one in bulansher near narora which is functional and forest department is uh, using that center so uh, these kinds of on ground interventions are being done uh, then uh, yeah so this is these are some of the major activities in uh, for the gangetic dolphin which are uh, taking place uh, so let me come to the next uh, species the dugong yeah. a species uh, many of us uh, will never see in its wild habitat probably true so, Yeah, yeah. So just tell us about the dugong or the sea cow, which is also known as the sea cow. Huh? Yeah, it's a large animal with a very flattish kind of face, it which is perfectly adapted to feeding on sea grass. So uh, this actually is more like a grazing marine mammal, and that is why perhaps it's also called sea cow. And it happily grazes on uh, the beds of sea grass, uh, which are critical for its. uh survival so uh, it's a very large uh, animal and uh, uh, there are only few places where uh, we have still some good population of uh, this interesting mammal uh, yeah so i mean primarily we have the best population right now in uh, Tam- off the tamil nadu coast in gulf of kutch uh, and uh, in addition uh, i mean gulf of mannar where you have the gulf of manar by biosphere reserve also in addition we have uh, population in gulf of kutch and andaman nicobar island and uh, we estimate that maybe we have some 200 individuals left so uh, this program uh, was is very different from i would say bustard program because bustard we had been already working for many many years so we had a good knowledge and not just wi even other researchers like dr rahmani and all and their student they had also developed a good ecological base for bustard but not that was not the case with dugong so this project started with a lot of learning part and uh, we did ecological assessment of dugong population and seagrass habitats in fact we have now developed a full directory of seagrass all the species which are there in uh, which constitute seagrass and uh, we have also mapped seagrass uh, habitats in these important habitats so that we can go ahead with their conservation uh then of course dugong is another species these are all areas where a lot of marine fisheries uh, take place as a income generate i mean as a livelihood for a whole lot of fishermen community on the coast so uh this program also has in fact in other programs also there is a good component on uh, outreach but dugong i think the outreach program is is the uh, is the highest and a um, lot of work on outreach is being done so uh, and in addition we are supporting the department in a lot of things uh, like for example we supported uh, tamil nadu uh, forest department in preparing the management plan for for gulf of mannar uh, marine national park and uh, in uh, andamans we did the threat mapping for rani jhansi and mahatma gandhi marine national parks we also conducted pilot drone surveys there so uh, and when it comes to outreach uh, we have uh, done a lot of outreach programs our in fact our team in uh, these areas is continuously doing that and uh, as per our thing we have already sensitized more than 20000 people living in these priority habitats 
we have also started what is called dugong scholarship program in which the needy kids from uh, these fishermen community they are supported uh, uh, in their education and uh, there is a volunteer program more than 1000 people have been registered as dugong volunteers uh, so and forest department traditionally has been a department working in terrestrial areas so we have trained uh, some 40 forest department staff to monitor marine life using scuba diving so these are all uh, uh, various steps through which we have reached out to uh, the stakeholders plus we are also so now these are areas where indian navy and indian coast guards have a good presence so uh, we have sent, sensitized more than 500 personnel from navy and coast guard in who are posted in these areas uh, for dugong monitoring and we continuously take their help also because here we are talking of much uh, larger areas which which do not have clear boundaries so that is why i think we need to take help from a lot of uh, stakeholders here so uh, we are also planning to we are also even giving training for rescue of marine animals already we have saved um, uh, quite a few dugongs which have been entangled in the nets uh, through our volunteer network through our rescue teams and uh, we are establishing a mobile marine mammal rescue facility with these uh, state forest departments and uh, so all these things i mean lot of activities are happening uh, for uh, you are hopeful basically you are very yeah. positive you are positive about this yes speech. surely 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 so let's come to the number 4 on the list uh, and right. which is which, uh, a species which is literally on a floating island the manipur dancing deer the sangai right, and right. I, i have written extensively about the sangai i have been lucky to see the sangai in kebul lamjao okay the challenges you see because uh, i know the that the, the the island the thickness of the island is decreasing and there is a lot of environmental impacts that's true how do you that's reverse true. that the species may do come back if this uh, the habitat i think here the habitat is a main concern that's true the habitat is the main concern uh, i mean there are no issues like poaching and all uh, but uh, habitat is definitely a major concern there and uh, uh, it is under pressure due to uh, it's a it's a aquatic habitat floating fundis which are the ideal habitat for this uh, very special animal and uh, these are the, the habitats which are pressured due to flood and even fire and uh, at times and uh, it's a single population so uh, there's always a chance of increasing mortalities due to disease there are issues with the 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 lake uh, it's like it's a hyper eutrophic uh, lake and uh, because of pollution or inflow of uh, pollutants uh, there is always a chance of eutrophication which can lead to uh, serious consequences on the aquatic aquatic ecosystems uh, so these are all issues with this uh, thing and uh presently we have like again here standardized the technique uh, for counting them or uh, doing assessment uh, which is much more scientific than traditionally being done and uh, we were intending to do the first uh, proper uh, scientific uh, survey this summer but uh, because of covid again that had to be pushed and it is yet to take place although the technique is standardized so uh, of course uh, the the major objectives is to strengthen the existing population then improve the habitat conditions there in kebul lamjao national park then another very important thing is to create a second population in the wild and we are working very closely with the manipur forest department to look for a, a second home uh, zero down on a few places and we are evaluating them and uh, of course involving local communities in conservation efforts without that nothing is possible so they are uh, being integrated and uh, we are also creating a, a, a planning to create a rescue center there uh, because there are times when these animals do stray out and get into human inhabitations although rarely so um, uh, the and uh, then vaccination of livestock against uh, some of the diseases which can uh, spread to Uh, the this animal and as i said it's a single population so we have to be particularly careful about diseases spread then uh, 
to i mean traditionally the this habitat was connected to other areas also so to how to restore connectivity that's another thing so uh, a lot of efforts are being done uh, only thing uh, manipur uh, well uh, it's it's far away from us also and uh, so i wouldn't say that the progress has been as fast and as quick as in the other three species uh, but nonetheless it is gaining momentum now uh, it has gained momentum and uh, uh, we hope that uh, things would improve and uh, finding a second home is very important because uh, keeping them in a single population can be dangerous even if we take a lot of effort to keep them uh, safe from spread of diseases but uh, one can never rule out and uh, there can be a situation uh, when uh, there can be serious effect on the population so uh, uh, that's uh, that's the thing about uh, so quickly, yeah, so quickly uh, before we end today so just there are also like as you mentioned in the beginning there are two dozen uh, species identified by the ministry for the right. recovery program so right. so if you can say something what's the rest of the future plan if there is a future plan right now? right 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 in fact we have already started addressing the uh, other species also uh, which have been identified for uh, which which have been identified as as endangered and uh, which need action so these are the species which uh, are all listed in our Uh, there is a program uh, scheme called integrated development of wildlife habitats so um, these are all in uh, i mean listed out over there in fact the latest uh, addition was the caracal uh, which was added about less than a year ago making it 22 uh, it's not 22 species because some of them are groups of species like the uh, marine turtles that includes four species so similarly i mean uh, there are few more groups like vultures so uh, but they are like broadly into 22 species or group of species so uh, uh, now the problem is that many of these species again are uh, having small populations or uh, population about which we do not know much so recently at the behest of moef we have uh, we have come up with a proposal which is uh, almost in the final stages of um, getting cleared at moefcc for funding which is about actually a uh, scientific assessment of these species because right now we do have information about their uh, estimated numbers but many of those uh, estimations are very crude they're not so scientific so to 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 work on endangered species we need to know how their populations are behaving and for that we need to have a very good rigorous scientific protocol so we are going to work on all these species we have as i said we have already submitted a proposal and uh, it's uh, in principle being agreed uh, for funding through campa and campa is the same source which has been funding our four species for species recovery for the last 5 years or so and we are very thankful for all the officials of uh, campa as well as moef for uh, supporting this program these are all uh, uh, quite quite cost intensive program so uh, once we start on these then we will develop the protocols for all these species scientific protocols as well as train the forest department and if requirement of any other department is also there them also on continuing with these monitorings we don't want to make it a scientific protocol which only scientists can run because it's not possible for scientists to continuously monitor so many species all over the country so we have to like just like in case of all india tiger estimation we have gradually empowered the forest department and now much of the work is done by the forest department themselves it's only the final analysis and all that where we play the uh, uh, the the key role but of course in other things also uh, we we are completely involved but gradually over the years over the cycles uh, the amount of work being done by forest department is now much more than what was there in the first cycle so same thing we hope will happen so we'll do we will be doing hand holding with the forest departments in these running these scientific protocols we will develop them and run them and here we are talking of many of the species which have one or two small populations so it can be done quite quickly for example hangul we know that it is only occurring in a few pockets in kashmir and uh, great indian one horned rhinoceros we know there are just a few locations where 
uh, you find them. Uh, so we uh, we do have a good knowledge about their ecology and definitely have some basic idea about how we can go for their estimation. But it has to be tried out in the field, standardized, and the and it has to be transferred to the forest department and other department personnel uh, who are relevant to this exercise. So that's the first step. And once we have monitored them properly, we have estimated them properly, this will also give us a good idea about their population, where all it exists, and uh, where all we need to focus. And then I think in the next step, we will uh, start working on their species recovery programs as well. Of course, many of them are already getting addressed through some program or the other. Uh, for example, the snow leopard is also listed here. So snow leopard, we know, I mean, through... Uh, uh, the government of India also uh, had a snow leopard uh, program and uh, presently uh, MOEF, UN, uh, UNDP, JEF funded secure program is ongoing for the snow leopard landscapes. So it's not that nothing is being done for these species. A lot of things have, are being done. Uh, but I think in a more planned manner, a proper species recovery program is required. And uh, we are working towards that. And the first step is to develop a proper monitoring protocol and the first assessment, scientific assessment of their population. Thank you so much. Thank you for this great overview of species conservation in the country. It's absolute pleasure to talk to you, Dr. Mohan. And as a media institution, we are always there to kind of lend our support in the species recovery program. Yeah, I'm, I'm so thankful to you. I mean, uh, I think... Uh, more and more people need to know about these programs. We need support from the public. We need support from the masses. And uh, of course, when masses support, then and then the political bosses also support. And everybody supports. Right? All, all, I mean, not that we are not getting this support. We are getting this support. But I think we can add on to that support, make it even more effective. Because the time is running out. Some of the species need action immediately. And uh, I, I only... I'm very confident with that, that the ethos of conservation in India, in an average Indian, I think we will be able to succeed in saving these species and we are not going to see any extinctions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.